All right. Yep. And we're recording. Sorry, go ahead. What were you saying? Do you want to wait for Kamal to open with um, some of the talk about what's going on? In yeah. Europe? Yeah, ideally. Um, but maybe you could just do real quick check-ins just to get us going on what we've been up to in the last week. Um, Sam, do you want to go first? Happy to. Thanks, Sid. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Since I'm nodding. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, I've been um, trying to get Airtasker to change some of the rules around how being a bit activist. So, um, Airtasker is a gig economy platform here in Australia. And they have rules around how um, if you don't keep using the platform, you lose your, your, your tiered rating and then you end up paying more in fees. So I'm try we're trying to get them to put a freeze on that so that workers aren't encouraged or incentivized to uh, keep working during our, our lockdown we got here in Melbourne. So it's really trying to stop the spread of COVID and um, yeah, they've just come out and said, no, they won't do it, but we've still got other avenues to explore with WorkSafe and, and uh, work, Fair Work uh, Commission. So, see what happens. You're on mute still, Sid. Can you call on someone to go next? Uh, Lynn, what have you been up to? Uh... Well, I don't know. A lot of a lot of this and that sort of. Not a super big focus that's, you know, worth chatting about here. And next? Uh Pospi. Uh playing with phones really. Uh and um yeah, just one one on marketplace stuff and looking at how the grandma binds to it. Uh, how about you, Sid? Thank you. I have been busy with um, some strategic conversations for the Reputation Vault and neighborhoods. Um, for those of you know, that's uh, you know something we've been talking about for a while, and also talking about when and where we want to start rolling out some of the conversations that we've been having. Um, so that's been a lot of fun. I've also been helping host the dev camp. So it's great to see um, all these app creators wanting to, I mean, starting to come into the ecosystem and wanting to figure out how to um, code and understand agent centricity. Also an interesting session, um, interesting model we developed with Bear called Build on Holochain, which is more for non-dev entrepreneurs, which has also been nice to give shape to. So let's see, that might actually be a format going forward. And I think that intersects really well with this modularity conversation. Um, and I'm gonna call on Bob to go next. Hey y'all. Uh, so, oops, I closed something here. Uh, so, so I I have been having fun with a uh, blog on economic networks, and uh, I'm picking up a whole bunch of things happening in around economic networks. One of some of them are in uh, the PDP Foundation and some of them are in co-op circles, cooperative circles around uh, 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 social.coop, and uh, there's a guy in Colorado that's putting together a, 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 a network of cooperatives, and they're starting to talk about that kind of thing. And I've been featuring what's happening in the whole chain uh, um, uh, periodically, and uh, so you, you know, it's sort of like a, it's sort of like a sidelight of what all you are doing, but uh, uh, it, it, it's for for me a sort of like organizing people in other areas. So we hope something will come of it. 
Thanks. And do you want to call on the next person? Let's just, let's just say Oops. Greg. I'll call for Bob. I can hey, tell hey, he's hey. like. <laughs> Thank you, Lynn. <laughs> no problem. Hey, thanks, Lynn. Um, yeah, just still getting into uh, a lot of Grace's course on currency design and some really cool conversations that she sends out to the class on. Like uh, a good one is uh, what the autonomy means in uh, the DAO. So some interesting stuff there. And I guess that leaves Kamal. Kamal, we're just Kamal. doing quick check-ins before we get started. Thanks, Greg. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm doing good. We're launching a um, circular economy high-low page in Seattle. Um, so getting really close to, uh, to launching. Um, and yeah, I've been exploring kind of high-low as a UI pattern and trying to f figure out who's doing what. Um, so, and I think that leads to the mapping questions, like who's doing what in general. So, uh, lots of questions about who's doing what. Thanks. So, I think on that note, we can get started. And I feel like Pospi had uh, suggested um, or would like Kamal to go first, and then we can dive into the marketplace question. Pospi, what, what do you think? Yeah, yeah, we, we talked about um, just sharing a bit of where the conversations are based in around. I was just hoping to get it from the horse's mouth. I'm a little bit behind myself. Mm. Yeah. Um, what we've kind of gotten to is we've realized that currency design is actually potentially the, oddly, the lowest hanging fruit. Um, since the class that we just took with um, the business course with uh, uh, Bear and David Atkinson, we kind of realized that we do have a rich amount of data and we do have a lot of storytelling to do about what is biodigestion and why biodigestion, why buy this fertilizer, what is this weird stuff? And so it seems like the need to show flows might be an important part of this process that we can actually pull off now. Um, and so we've just been looking at currencies in a different way. I think since the class, we we're just like, oh, right, there's so many other currencies we could be talking about. I think we were singularly focused on financial currency, and I think that was short sighted. Um, so I think that's probably where we are is more like what do we have now that we can actually launch and work with and build on yeah I think that's what I have <laughs> oh and then actually the last piece of that and Feli would say is that our eventual goal is to help impact bioenergy sell more biodigesters it seems to be a need across the board and so you know this capital as a service seems to be another piece of the puzzle that is our eventual hope and goal um but do you say capital as a service that's what feli's been calling it i'm just stealing feli's words <laughs> <laughs> isn't that just loans well if you look at it from the currency design perspective it's kind of like what um Oh, you mean not um, Jewel, necessarily Jewel's financial capital? Correct. Yeah, like Jules is like helping raise sort of capital mm. to help build more dryers, right? Yeah. Actually, Feli should answer that question. Yeah. <laughs> but I like the framing as a service. I feel like we're doing that with everything these days. I, was, I, I came across this funny meme where someone was trying to explain uh, government services or paying your taxes as something as a service. Um, but anyway. Um, yeah, you just need to get enough investment money before you get arrested. <laughs> First, we go ahead. Uh, yeah, do we want to look at some UI stuff? Is that the order yeah. of the day? Yeah. 
Uh, maybe, oh, I need screen share. Oh, sorry. So I'm, I'm very glad to have Win on this call because this is kind of me exploring possibilities and checking the sense of what I'm doing as I go. Um, so that should be worthwhile. Can you all see what's on my screen? Yep. Um, so yeah, it's really bare bones at the moment visually. This is, this is a pretty simple form that's I'm mostly working on data hookup and stuff. Um, but I just kind of want to start at the top level and burrow down into what it's doing in terms of REA um, and you know, jump in, ask questions as we go. We'll try and shed some light on what it all means. Uh, and Lynn, please jump in when you see things that feel awkward or suboptimal. Um, yeah, it also kind of throws into sharp relief the importance of uh, like translations and um, the language of this stuff, because really this, you know, I mean, this is all text that you're looking at at the moment. So this is very much like a grammatic translation of what the language we use around a marketplace and how to turn that into the language of REA. Um, and it's kind of even more than that because it's a bit of Lynn's opinions as to what makes sense for an REA marketplace. And it's a bit of my ideological opinions about the ways I want people to think in marketplaces. So you can see right from the bat, like what we do today and it starts with give something, which is maybe not what you would expect for a normal marketplace. Maybe you'd expect trades to be a normal thing. Um, but I guess I'm kind of pushing for people to be more gifting in the ways they interact. So you know, default options on forms tend to have a certain impact. Um, hey, Posby. And I, yeah. Is there any way you can crank up your sound just a little bit? You're a lot quieter than other um, people. I don't know. It's not if not, I'll just crank moment. you up and. Yeah. Don't worry. Uh, don't worry if not. I think I might today. So I yeah, or if you move closer to the laptop, might help. Is it good enough? Yep. Yeah, okay. We'll go from here. Uh, so yeah, there's this this kind of top level choice that I'm asking people to make about between are you going to gift something? Are you going to ask for something? Are you going to offer something and expect something in return? Or are you going to request something and offer something in return? Um, so there's these kind of four distinct types here. And you can see as I toggle them, it's only the things under this line here that change really. Um, and there's some interesting things about what that means in terms of REA proposals and intents. Um, so this, this stuff above the line here is all related to the proposal, which is the thing that people would actually see on the marketplace, because like this is the listing that's been put up. Um, but then these bits that move under here are the individual specific intents about what that request actually means. So this is where you get into the, um, the very deliberately articulated resource movements that REA is about. Um, I'll show you the code too because it's kind of interesting. So this is, this is the create offer form that we're looking at at the moment, this top level form. Um, and you can see here when you start looking at the form markup, for a start, there's these radio groups here which control these, these options. Um, and I've got some labels there that aren't in, in a uh, translation framework yet, but will be at some point. And these basically toggle this listing type value and the listing type value decides which of these subforms to show. Um, so that's all pretty standard if you're used to declarative UI stuff and the way that these apps tend to look. Um, and you can see I'm pulling in these two components basically. So uh, so when, when we're doing a gift, there's just this offer intent that you're offering something and that's all that it is. Um, whereas if you have a need intent, then it's you're requesting something. So there's a different form to deal with that. Um, but kind of further to that, when you look at what these actually are in these forms, um, like this is the offer intent here and this is the request intent here. And so you can see that these are both just presentations of an underlying intent form. Um, and a slightly different configuration as to how the, the intent is wired up. So one thing being that when you're offering something, um, your own agent ID gets placed as the provider of the intent. And when you're requesting something, your own agent ID gets placed as the receiver. And that's sort of the, the principal difference between the two. Um, but the other is in the language you use to frame it to people. So uh, if I go back to the form, like when I'm gifting something, then we're asking, what are you offering? Um, and there's, 
you know, these, these different options here, like I'm giving something, I'm lending something, I'm doing some work, I'm providing a special service. When I ask for something, I've got a different heading and a different set of text here. Like I want to ask for something I need, or I want to borrow something, I want to get help doing a task. But these really are just the inverse of these. It's just, you know, whether you're the recipient of that or not determines how you um, see it. And um, just a quick question. This maps on to the REA intent, right? Yes, it does. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you can see here, so these these action form labels that are presented um, in this little block here, um, these are just the friendly labels I'm giving to these REA event action types. So the transfer event means you're giving a resource to somebody. It could also be a payment. Um, the transfer custody, whoops. The transfer custody, uh, that's a private number, I don't know why someone's calling me. Um, the transfer custody is like you're, you're giving control of, an, of a resource to somebody else, but not the full resource. And then you've got work, which is still a resource transfer. It's still an event like everything else in REA, but it's you're giving some time and some work. And we actually distinguish, and there's a special one for deliver service, which I think is more of an outcome-based thing than work typically. It's like, you know, the service you're delivering is you're fixing a broken coffee machine, say. Um, so it's like the, the contract is to fix the thing. It's not how many hours it takes. But I, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Lynn, but I think you could do them the same way. Like you could have a special service that is measured in hours and you say it's five hours of repair time. Um, generally, well, one way to think of services is they might involve and often do involve things that in addition to work. Um, so yeah, I think what you said first makes more sense. It's like more, you know, it's like go to the dentist. That's a service. You're going to get a, a cleaning, you know, whatever. Um, yep. Those are services, but it's a lot more than the dentist puts in three, two hours on you, you know? Yeah. More the outcome. Um, yeah, yeah. An outcome that's not like a, a good. It's a service. <laughs> um. There's also something interesting about this in the layer that I'm putting over the top of REA because you know you could just have a form where it lists all the REA action types and you pick the ones that you want. Like you could just say that this is work and call it work in UI. Um, but we're trying to kind of wrap up those low level concepts and turn them into more meaningful things. I think with the principal goal being to make data entry easier. Um, so I haven't yet implemented them, but looking at this form that manages the actual intents and um, there's a space here where you're selecting uh, like the form title, so it's, it's this part here. Um, so when I wanna ask for something I need, this input here should be where you pick the particular resource or the type of resource or thing you need. But depending on what option you've chosen here, it makes sense to show a different kind of resource type and a different set of data in this box, at least as a priority. Like, if I'm asking for something I need and thus um, requesting uh, a transfer, then I'm probably not interested in all the work skill types of resources that are in the system. So when I start typing here, it might start that if I type a um, uh, tracking number, it goes and searches the, the observation DNA to find the appropriate specific, you know, resource in inventory that I'm looking for. Or if it can't find that, then it might default back to its type of resource and be looking for something abstract that says, you know, uh, crates of apples, say. Um, but it's it just helps you to not have to type, you know, you start typing apple and, okay, I can't think of a skill, like appliance repair, say, shows up in the list and that's not what you want when you're asking for a thing you need. But if you're getting help doing a task or delivering a special service, then appliance repair makes sense to show in that space versus Apple. Um, so they just kind of, it's an example of how these different sort of small ontologies in the REA system play together and ways that UIs really are mostly about starting to provide intelligence and restrict what's possible to make it less onerous for people to enter the data, I think. Um, so yeah, wanted to point some of those things out. Is there any questions before we go too much further? Do we, um, I love this, thank you so much. Um, I'm curious uh, if we could look at Hilo really quickly and see, I don't know if this is gonna, if we're gonna go in the Hilo direction or not, but I'm curious of your thoughts on 
what you've laid out and how they've laid it out and if you see a bridge yeah there's a bridge there um do you want to share because you've got mock sure. for high low don't you? yeah um, and we can just talk through them visually um, Uh, so when I make a post, it brings something like this up. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's discussion request, and it does change, similar to what you did, it does change the options as yeah. you change what it is. So I think, I think the first thing with Hilo is that in terms of the form I'm building at the moment, the mapping is kind of like the offer on Hilo maps to the uh, the gift something on my form, and the request mm -hmm. on Hilo maps to the ask for something on my form. So they're they're both atomic requests in that you're not pairing it with anything. You're not saying like I want to offer something, but I'm expecting something in return, and you're not saying I'm requesting something, but I want to offer something in return. Um, I think you might so be actually. I, I I think that would work both ways, but you you aren't going to be able to define what that is other than in inside of the text. Yeah. Like you can do it description. in the description, but there's no, yeah, structure there's no separate structure. Yeah. 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 Um, so you're saying so exchange, yeah. exchange is the missing piece. Yeah. Essentially like you scoped out the marketplace the other day. Um, and that is sort of the missing piece here is just really it's about pairing offers and requests and linking them together to say that this offer maps to this request kind of thing and that you know the the request is sitting there waiting to be filled looking for an offer that kind of matching um, is what Got this it. allows for um, and the other one is resources like they are a bit weird and I feel like they're very different to what we think of as resources um, but this would really just map to an economic event in OEA is how I would model it. So uh, there's kind of a distinction between in, in Hilo when they're mapping, when they're adding requests and offers, they're talking about the intention to do something. They're not talking about it's already done, but when they're mapping resources, they're very much talking about this tree that provides pairs exists in the orchard down the block kind of thing. Right. So, you have to put a location down. Yeah. For, um, for resources. Yeah. So there's there's okay. another there's another you know layer of constraint that you might implement in a UI like the one I'm building where there's certain kinds of forms where you do actually require the location to be present, whereas in the form I'm doing it's not required. So you can you could have a resource without a location. Question. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Can you can you actually do economic events in Hilo? Can you say? Can, can you actually transfer a resource and then uh, get something in return and see where that went and uh, yeah, no. uh, track not, it from there? Not, or... Yeah, not yet. And I think that's kind of why I've been bringing it up is like there's an opportunity for a bridge for Hilo and Holo to come, to get, to come together in this moment, potentially. Yeah, I like thinking about this avenue in the context of further modularizing the inventory and functionality that's in Holo REA at the moment. Because if you pull that out and make it its own separate module, then it's a module you can plug into Hilo to add inventory and functionality and even, you know, plug into Hilo subjectively as an individual and not have to have it plugged into Hilo for everybody. Um, mm. Because yeah, I, one of the off the cuff short ways I've been describing what we're building versus what Hilo is building is that um, you know, this would be Hilo plus the ability to do your tax and resource planning in Hilo. Um, mm -hmm. So that's, that's kind of the main difference. And I think at this point, Hilo are not interested in biting off that piece of the puzzle because it's a really big piece to bite off. Um, and, you know, it, it raises all sorts of like reliability and compliance things. Like once you start, people start trusting your system for their bookkeeping, it, there's a lot more, you know, problems if things go wrong and a lot more potential needs to be paid. So, um, yeah. Must be, being kind of yeah. A, yeah. No, go ahead. Finish it up. Oh, just the goal of it being more of a community uh, management platform that's more relaxed mm. and leaves the heavy, intense bookkeeping stuff to other systems is kind of mm. their design philosophy, I think. 
Yes, yeah, so related to that, can you share your thoughts on what it would take to actually build a bridge from high low to REA and if it would be worth it? And maybe that's like your thought as to why you chose Swelt over just working with high low. Um, well, the Svelte high low thing doesn't have all that much to do with high low. Um, yeah, those those two don't really interact. It's just that I, I yeah, don't. Sorry, I meant Svelte to REA. Like why you chose to work with Svelte as opposed to just re-engineering Hilo. Yeah, well, it's got, I mean, I might end up re-engineering Hilo. Uh, mm. It's got nothing to do with Hilo as an organization, just to do with React as a framework. Mm. Um, and I don't, ideally, I don't want to create a UI kit that only React developers can use. Um, so that's really the only reason that I'm not diving into Hilo UI and using that to throw this together. Um, but I can see myself probably combing through Hilo UI and using some styles and things as I go. And make, you know, that would be a nice goal is to make this UI work compatible with Hilo so that you can use these components in mashups that are using Hilo UI stuff. So um, what's, what's the status of Hilo go, moving to Holo, like Hilo Holo or Holo Hilo? So is that, is that I, mean, I mean, are we talking about, are we talking about a partnership that is actually uh, somewhere in the feasible future or not? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, it, we'll, we'll have to wait until Terran or Hilo open source whatever work they're doing on that. Like they have, I have seen the project sort of surface in the Holochain GitHub org, but it hasn't had activity publicly in many months at least. Um, do you have any indication they're working on it behind the scenes? Or, no or idea. that Holo is doing some other kind of similar, you know, or do we not yeah, really no, know? Not really, no. no. Um, I um, I set up a meeting with Bear next week and Bear's gonna, what I just, uh, what I basically was thinking was, I wanna help with the mapping because we there seems to be a lot of need here, regardless of Hilo, but I'm using Hilo to kind of be like, okay, what's going on here? Who's doing what? Is it going on? Um, I wanted to, at some point, offer sort of an opinion on a the cleanest way to interface Hilo and uh, Holo REA uh, now or later. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, well, you, you were kind of asking the question, so I was just going to jump into that briefly now. Um, this is a map I put together a while ago, which is kind of mostly about social engineering and getting um, user groups interested. But beyond that, there's this kind of section in yellow here, which is the migration path, um, where I'd like to see a value flows compatible Hilo work stream with the value flows community coming in to add features to Hilo to make it compatible with the FUI. Um, there is also some potential inter interdependence here between the value flows UI and um, Commons Pub's UI library and Hilo's UI library, but I've just kind of put it as a box in the middle floating because I'm not sure yet when we'll converge basically, but I'm hoping it's soon. And I think uh, Kamal's presence and interactions with them will probably drive it to some degree. Um, anyway, it's this last piece really is the thing. For me like if we built data federation capabilities through activity pub into hilo which seems like it's getting easier and easier then you can internetwork the federated data from hilo with commons pub so then you've got um, a value flows compatible hilo that talks to kind of the more enterprise grade does your tax for you version of the client server system that's a bit like hollow rea if that makes sense um, and yeah, getting to further to actually interoperable with Holochain basically means having a protocol scheme and a way of addressing data on Holochain natively, um, which I think will be something that can only happen after the Holo hosting network launches probably, or at least you know the next internal rewrite of Holochain. Um, but yeah, it's it's the data federation anyway. Once we have that, then all these things talk to each other, and I can see us likely implementing data federation capability to whole REA at some point, so that you can have 
a value flows based app running within Holochain that still talks to some Web2 infrastructure and you know, lets you cross collaborate with people on the old version of Hilo in addition to the Holochain version. That all seems possible. Wow. <laughs> So would would uh, Holo REA be able to talk to Commons Pub through yeah, Federation, yeah. server to server? Awesome. I would think so and hope so. And I mean, you know, we, we can do it without Federation, <laughs> but then we're just putting responsibility on everyone that they have to be able yeah. to run the Holochain nodes themselves to get at the data. Yeah. Um, but you know, if that's not, if we can expose that through Holo hosting setups in some way, then that and that treats it as web native and it's less of an issue. So I'm just not sure. Mm -hmm. What we'll end up That'd be doing cool. There. Yeah. Just um, to see what I. Hmm? What yeah. is Sorry, just quickly. Sorry, Sam. Posby, what's um, what's Commons Pub? Ah, that's um, another value flows implementation being built on an Elixir backend for Activity Pub. Um, so this is their website, and I might as well show. this module um, because this is the way that I'm thinking about pluggability for these apps. Um, so there's now this package on npm graphical client mock in the value flows UI org and that's actually what I'm using at the moment driving this so um, it's hard to see because it does it transparently but uh, here I've got this element that binds to an agent from um, here it is, yeah, context agent. Uh, this, this element here that binds to an agent from Holochain um, or from the back end, and at the moment it's connected to a mock data source in the back end. Um, but because it's using the same exact GraphQL schema as Holo REA, it's exactly compatible and pluggable with Holo REA. And uh, eventually will be exactly compatible and pluggable with Commons Pub as well because they all run the same spec. So. Um, in fact, I have it as a, a config environment variable at the moment. It's literally <clears throat> a one line change to swap it out. So if I do that, then I've got a Holochain backend running on a real Holo REA as long as I'm running all the Holochain stuff. But if I don't want to do that, I can just run it on the mock data source and not have to settle that up. Oh. And is, that what, is that what federated means? Federated data? No. Uh, federation is more like I, I'm going to write a bunch of records onto your server, but then your server, because it has some trust link set up with this other server over here, they'll replicate that data between them. So um, like Riot IM and the Mastodon platform are both federated platforms, so they work similarly. Basically, it means that you still require some technical expertise to set up and run a server, but you can run a distributed web of servers rather than a central server. So. Um, you end up with kind of like community nodes all running and interoperating together and more resilience that way. Like you can find somebody on another server on another instance because they know how to talk to each other, basically. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so this is one thing about uh, Activity Pub and Commons Pub is that they start. They are essentially at this point social networks. So they give you the social networking capability out of the box, you know, which is another thing that Hilo gives you out of the box. And so the Commons Pub Gang is going to add value flows, economic networking capabilities to Activity Pub, and so that will give them the ability to do the both the economic network and the social networking. So, for example. Um, it, it, the thing, one of the things that came to mind here, uh, and this is, has to do with Cabal, uh, uh, if, if you are uh, uh, gonna, if, it, how in Hilo would you send a batch of uh, uh, biodigested liquid fertilizer to a farmer and give them an assay of, of what are all the constituents of that, you know, the, the, the various, the very, the, the kinds of things that you would want to want to look for uh, on the constituents of a fertilizer from a farmer's viewpoint. And then what went into that batch, you know, where did it come from? And uh, 
uh, you know, are there any heavy metals in there that I have to be concerned about? So, you, you know, so that, that, those are the kinds of things like how in Hilo and, or how would you take a Hilo thing and then connect it to Holochain to give you the rest of that information? What, so, I, what I'm well, imagining, go ahead. I just had a uh, thought like, yeah, go ahead. What I'm imagining is that Hilo is not Hilo in the, in, in my um, imaginations of Hilo on Holo, I'm imagining it's just little pieces. It's basically a shared visual language um, that we use on a front end that gives visual consistency for multiple apps, multiple mm -hmm. things. So I think uh, um, possibly you said it like, you know, when you go to email, everything kind of looks like email, right? It doesn't matter what service you use. So it's more of like a visual consistency and some patterns that we all use across the board. So it's not just like this type of UI and this type of UI and this type of UI. Um, we could do that, but it's just like start starting new every time and it sounds like a lot of replicated work. I think that makes sense, Kamal, and I would add one more piece to it, which is that I think, um, well, I think Hilo's core is the social networking. Yeah. Holo REA's core is the economic networking. I would put the touch point right there, mm -hmm. you know, and the touch point would be more than I can have a discussion or I can make an offer or of something or whatever. The touch point would be more like, oh, I'm having a discussion and that we're talking about something that economic that we could do. And then that, that data gets connected or I'm taught, you know, I made an offer and you're looking at my offer. So you, you should be able to start a discussion on my offer so we can talk about it and negotiate or whatever. So there would be like a data point that connects any or a lot of the Holo REA things, <laughs> objects for lack of a better word, with a discussion or with several threads or however we want to do it, but it's a fairly simple data link. And I think it's a lot simpler than trying to map, well, here's our marketplace offer. How does that map to Hilo's marketplace offer? Because in fact, theirs is a, a lot more limited and it's going to be because that's not their focus there. You know, their, their little economic stuff around the fringe is more, um, you know, I've got community, I've got social networking, and sort of by the way, I might want to think about this other stuff because it's connected. Um, so I think we ought to have the core competencies be what they are and then have this little fairly tidy data point connection. And if we can get the UI um, kind of look and feel to, you know, be consistent as you're talking about that would be awesome yeah so i'm not talking about like this is sort of a, a step back from is hilo going to work on holochain or not you know this is no, just I like agree. how do we map them no i 100 percent agree i i sent a version where i had it similar to facebook and i don't know if this is right but you know facebook um i'm gonna see if i can find it but they have you know your, your regular kind of feed but then underneath on the left, it says marketplace. And so you click on that and you see a whole marketplace, right? Completely different rules, completely different UI. You can message each other, but it doesn't work like a social media site. And, I, and I, that's kind of my current assumption of how it would work. And what's great about that is then REA really takes over. And you can then have a whole new rule set but the users, the agents, it's what connects the whole, connects the, the two worlds. I think there might even be like a, a public space, you know, private space kind of difference there. Like in the public spaces, because they're anonymous, REA tends to be the central place you land because you're there as an anonymous agent who's just doing economic interactions. But then if you're in a particular collaboration space with a group of people that you work on projects with, you probably have a more social kind of nexus that you begin your interactions from and REA maybe flows from there rather than being the focus. 
um, yeah, I just think there's something in that. Yeah, I think that's exactly the thought I had, and it links with some of the conversations you had around neighborhoods, like can that social connection drive commerce? And I think the approach then is totally different, like the way you lay out your AI, the way people discover each other, um, all of that, the emphasis is more on the social connection. Um, quick question though, Bosby, like, sorry, go ahead, yeah. let's finish this. Uh, I was just, before we move on, I just thought it was worth mentioning Hummer. I don't know if you've interacted with them, Kamal, but they have. They were in the early days of Holochain around quite a bit. And they're building a publishing platform, really. But there's a lot of discussion and thought with them about, well, what is the value of a story and how how does it create stronger cohesion in a group when you start with that as the foundation before you begin the economic interaction? So I guess don't underestimate the creativity of the hollow chain ecosystem like you might end up with a place that like a blog and a storybook is kind of a central place that the community starts their interaction from um yeah who knows sorry sid yeah it'd be great, um, great to be able to have both you know kind of both ways mm -hmm. depending on the group the person yeah be awesome no they've all got access to all the apps for all the different lenses they want to look at it through right like you could have people in this storytelling community that are like no i don't want to tell stories but I don't know. What are they doing there then? <laughs> so um, correct me if I'm wrong, but it feels like the only reason we're thinking about high-low and high-low and hollow is this slick conversational front end, right? Um, and and the, um, the, uh, the way I've been thinking about is networks and communities. Mm -hmm. Most, mostly it's the, the architecture. Mm. Yeah, I, I think also that it's necessary for an economic network to also be a social network. I think you're going to find that, that, that those are requirements. Those are mm. not uh, those are not nice to have. So you have to have that merger of both of them. Mm. And I think, honestly, yeah. that's what excites me about a hollow chain, right? Like, that's what we don't have elsewhere. So anyway, possibly my question is, like, how hard would that be? to recreate using Svelte or any other of the tools that we've been exploring? Um, well, I think it doesn't need to be done necessarily. I'm probably gonna pause when I get the functionality working the way I want it to, and then make sure that this Svelte to React build pipeline works before going too much further. Mm. Um, because if I'm not unlocking multi, multi framework components, then it's not really any reason to keep dealing with something new and weird and wonderful because JavaScript gives you enough of that on its own. Um, does that answer your question? Yes, yes. And I guess then we have to figure, yeah, I guess we wait to see it like that um, sweat to react pipeline. Like, I guess we figure that out and see. Yeah. I guess that's what they're saying. Yeah. Um, also, we just have no, to understand. Uh, sorry, go ahead. No, you go. I was going to say, we also just have to figure out what Holochain social apps are going to be available sooner than later, you know? Uh -huh. Yeah, I think the answer to Bob's question is uh, we talk about Hilo because they are talking to Holochain and it's, you know, there's, there's movement there. And because they've got a production amp and quite a nice UI and a UI kit that seems generally applicable and worth using. Um, and also because they do a little bit of the marketplace -y stuff, like they're kind of just touching the edges of what can be offers and listings. But no. that means they're, <clears throat> yeah, I guess as Bob said, they're a social network that wants to facilitate the beginning of sharing interactions even more specifically than economic interactions maybe. Yeah. Um, but they don't want to handle the heavy lifting of how that moves under the hood. But we do. So maybe this is the frame for now because um, I'd like to finish the thought about this form before the call yep. is up. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so, so Lynn and I were parts of Hilo way, way back when it was first getting started uh, and um, liked a lot of things about it. Uh, and all kinds of things would try to start there 
and people would be start starting to wanting to do something together and you could never complete it within high low it would you would get stuck and you could you know and then they would go off and go someplace else and so this is a constant problem with high low it takes you it takes you somewhere and then drops you and you can't go there anymore so 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 they so they need high low as we were experiencing it needs the economic networking part to complete what people want to start doing there. I 100% agree. That's that's what I'm seeing. And that's why I, I see Holo REA and all the conversations we've been having about this common common marketplace seems to be the other part of the high level conversation. So that's kind of what I'm trying to figure out. Yeah. I will, I will just quickly add like for five seconds before or speak and finish is um, like I think a key element is also the reputation element, like how people discover each other. Mm -hmm. Can we actually get in there and start architecting the flow of content and discoverability? Because I think when we're talking about economics as a result of social relationships, like that's super critical because maybe that is hardwired within Hilo. I don't know. Uh, and won't be able to mess too much with it. But yeah. That's, it does come up for me the um, thinking about Philips Chimera interfaces and having these kind of pluggable slots that you can add UI to. So in that example of you know a raw REA marketplace that's very sterile and kind of anonymous when you land there, versus one that maybe starts as a storybook of people's narratives that then lead into economic interactions that have happened because of those narratives. So then it's like in that community they've chosen that as the primary frame for people once they come inside their membrane. Mm. Um, and then being that they've chosen that, um, oh, this thought's hard to hold off. Um, like how do, how do you fiddle with the UI in the standard REA marketplace in a way that's easy so that you can add references and visual bits to take people into the story if they arrive in the sterile uh yeah. marketplace view um so yeah i can those are interesting questions it'll be i'd love to see if we can do it fully dynamically but i expect it might be a, like people in that space would remix an app specifically for that functionality that has you know the the marketplace plus the stories um, is it I, I, I think i get what you're saying possibly is it kind of like a workflow question so you're saying Hmm. There's a there's like a workflow right. which you want communities to be able to develop themselves. So one workflow is just simply a economic workflow, and another workflow has that um, kind of story and community focus. Yeah, it's like your there there would be a group that's weaving a story focus into their economic layer. So then, how do you make the story focus visible to people that are entering the community through the economic layer? So they're not just kind of stuck in that bubble and not able to see the story. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, possibly so back go ahead. To this, back to this form. Uh, to, this would kind of answer the question as to how we get from the simple, like these two options here on the simple high-low functionality. Um, so the gift something is an offer in high-low. And I don't know how it works in high-low. You, you just do tags, don't you? So these, all these options here are probably the equivalent of high-low's tags. Like you wouldn't need to specify whether you're giving something or lending something. You just put some tags in and put a time if it feels appropriate. Um, but for here, I'm trying to wrap up some things so that say, if I'm giving something, I'll tell you what it is and I'll put in how many of them I'm giving. Um, but if I'm lending something, then I want to know how long I'm lending it for as well. And Lin in value flows, this is like the resource quantity and the effort quantity that we put on the intent. Um, and do some work, you've just got the time. And the specialized service, I've just got the time as well. But I'm not actually sure if that's right. I think you might want the time as well as another unit, um, potentially. Or even this might be more advanced. Um, and actually, there was something else to call out about this too, because... We have a due date, and it's one that I haven't been terribly sure on. Um, but I did put it in uh, uh, like this, yeah. So when I'm, if I'm gifting something, I'm assuming that there's no due date. I'm ready to gift it whenever. And if I'm requesting something, then I'm going to add this field to say there's a specific due date, but it you know has to be before. 
but there's also I'm changing the wording here to say when would you prefer it because then you might set a time range here to say that you know ideally I want it between the 12th and the 15th but someone could then send an intent to say well I can give it to you on the 16th but it's still before the 20th so does that work is that is that kind of how you were seeing due being used then um i don't know if i followed all of that but yeah do i mean do a lot comes from um work kinds of things where you know a group has planned a lot of work and there's dependencies and you know i need somebody to do this piece of work because nobody in my group can do it and it has to be done by x time you know it's sort of a it's more you could think of it more around project manage management y kinds of things yeah, you know or i need this part because i need to put it into this other you know assembly next week or you know yeah it's it's an interesting one because for me it kind of changes the semantic meaning of the time fields on the intent like okay. if there's if there's no due date and i'm just gifting something then I'm just specifying when's it available, you know, like that's that's all that really means. But once there's a due date, then you know, that's kind of a hard stop and the time fields just become a preference almost. I don't know if I'm reading that right, but that's kind of how it feels to me. Um, Let me give that some thought now that I've kind of seen so, what you've got here and we can, okay. it's, it's a little too detailed for this second, I think, but yeah. Um, and I just kind of want to point out about that too. Um, just the way this logic is cascading through. So uh, in this form, I have a, the action here, the transfer action um, is what this, these ones are changing here. So this is transfer, transfer custody, work, etc. cetera. Um, and then basically all of the, the values.action value is driving all the rest of this form in terms of the headings that are displayed and the inputs that are available stuff so all that stuff in REA it doesn't really have any rules about what you can specify and what you can't but here I'm now imposing a bunch of my own business logic rules in the form to say you know if I'm borrowing something then I'm going to want to specify a quantity and a time duration I mean they're, they're still yeah. kind of optional and you can leave them out but I'm not even going to show you those things if you're if you're getting help doing a task say but because there's no quantity of things you need when you're working. I think that's totally appropriate for the UI to do. Yeah. But in a more advanced UI, it may not be. And, you know, in a different lens, it may not be. Well, there's so a ton of different use cases for, you know, a very simple core model. So, yeah. Yeah. So then the other parts here that we haven't talked about are these two, make an offer and request an exchange. Um, and if you just look at the horizontal lines in this form, you can see that basically when you look at gift something I've got much the same start here as make an offer and in fact it is exactly the same because an offer is just a gift and then a corresponding uh, request so, yeah um, so you know some different headings on this form to describe what it means in the context of giving an offer but actually if you look at the code um, these ones here. Uh, so when I'm in an offer here, I'm using the exact same form controls. There's an offer intent and a request intent. It's just that the request intent has a different title on it and some different labels on the form to contextualize it, but it's, it's still sending the same data. Um, and the other interesting thing to note about these, I'm actually having some issues with it. I don't know if Svelte allows it, but ideally this is what I would be doing. Um, so just to note that like this top level thing that we call a proposal, so this this thing that we're actually naming and listing and describing. Um, there's the concept in that proposal of what is the primary intents that you're actually, you as the person sending the proposal are after, and what are the intents that are just reciprocation for that proposal. So when I've got an offer here, it's the offer intent that's updating the primary intent, but when I've got a request intent, it's the request intent that's updating the primary intent and vice versa. There's, there's a, a reciprocal intent for the request here and a reciprocal intent for the offer here. Um, but they're, they're very much independent records that have their own meaning outside of the, the overarching uh, proposal. So it means that if you're not looking at this in a marketplace context and you're just looking at it in a planning context, you may not see this listing that I'm doing that says I want tomorrow or something oh wow that binding is awful okay 
I'm hoping that's debug related. Um, so yeah, you won't you won't see those things. What you would see instead is just something coming through saying that you know I want to be given five x, um, and that doesn't it doesn't need to be aware of the fact that you want to offer ten dollars in return. But there's these other things you can use to to um, make those associations, which is what this page is dealing with. Um, so yeah, and the other thing to note about them. Uh, so looking at the request one where if you want to ask for something and here's the things you're offering in return. This would be the same as adding a request and an offer in Hilo. Um, and actually on this same topic, like adding the request and offer in Hilo, seeing those as separate things is actually what you would see from the planning layer in, in REA. If you didn't look at this as a marketplace and you just looked at it as a planning space, you would just see these two separate intentions that someone wants something and someone's offering something. Um, and the other bit that's not yet implemented that could now fairly easily be implemented is variable amounts of the above. So uh, an example from my own life, maybe like maybe someone's renting a house and the, so the, the offer is your lending for rent uh, and it's one room for, you know, one, I didn't put a week in yet because it's just dummy data, but a week. Um, and then something you want in return and just being able to add more of these and say like, okay, I want uh, $100 per week, um, but I also then want, you know, 10 hours per week of work in the garden and being able to group all under, those, under the same proposal to say that there's actually a whole set of different kinds of things that I'm offering and requesting um, is the next logical step for this form, which really just needs to be a case of turning these values into arrays. Like, I'm working it step by step, so at the moment I've got a single value for the primary intent and the reciprocal intent. And uh, if you're making a gift listing, then you're only getting the primary intent, the same as the need. If you make an offer or request listing, you get the reciprocal as well. But actually, REA is not aware of any of this stuff. This is all logic that's just in the form. And um, if these were then arrays and you had controls to just kind of add more, add less, then you'd just be basically having an each loop that spits out more of these forms in response to that number. And they will update things in the array and uh, in the final submission, all that data would go through to Holochain. So that's how the complexity of REA starts to stack on top of the simpler um, sharing systems. Thank you. That was a lot. What's yeah. any questions? On yeah, that? that that looks really good to me. I really like that you have made it into a human friendly, like similar to how Hilo does it. You know, mm. it's like how would you start thinking through mm. this? I think that's really um, a good way to approach it. Yeah. Yeah, you've broken okay, that start. down really well. That's me. Awesome. Good. Um, well, another yeah, thought. Really... Go ahead. Yeah. I know I was just going to say I'm keen to start exploring what you know the power user well not power user but just powerful functionality in, in each of these specific controls looks like um, like I just actually I show show everybody on the call because I'm pretty stoked with it like the this um this measurement input that I built here um, at the moment it's just kind of got some hard coded data in it but looking at what it is like there's there's just almost no code there it's felt and it's so easy to just declaratively say, you know, I've got this number input here, I've got this select here, it's bound to these values, so these will automatically then update when you change the controls. And then this here's a, a reactive declaration that Svelte uses, so this, this dollar sign colon weird prefix. But this basically says that anytime any values on the right hand side here change, basically, so numerical value or unit, so anytime those change, it'll update normalized value to give it this value which means then when I'm in this offer field, I've literally just got a measurement input and I'm binding it to the normalized value and I send it to the value in the form. And that's all I have to do. All the wiring is automatically reactive and, and done for you and optimized. So yeah, it's, um, it's pretty neat, but it, it they immediately bring up a lot of questions for me. Like this one here, there's a lot of stuff you can do with preferences for, you know, does the user prefer um, SI units or Imperial units? And you know, a flag to say I'm inputting time, so I only show the units that are relevant to time. Or I'm, you know, I'm doing 
a measurement for this particular resource. So I could go to the back end and fetch what the default unit of measure for that resource is and automatically select it. There's all yep. these things that are woven through REA that really let you take the load off the user in terms of what they have to do. Um, and I'm looking forward to a lot more of these smart UI components that bundle up that logic. Um, and it, yeah, there's, a, there's another big question conversation to have around um, the resource types and um, I think it's on the flows page in the docs, but this, yeah, this uh, idea of granularity, um, like for me, it feels like when you're specifying a resource on anything in an REA system, this is kind of the, or the order of precedence. Like you're either talking about a specific resource that you know about, or you're talking about a specific type of resource that you understand well, or you're, you're talking about a very loose type of resource that you don't understand all that well at all when you get to that classification. Um, so yeah, I'd like to see one control that's smart enough to pull that data in and knows how to draw from the right places and you know, the form can selectively tell it, like I don't care about inventory, so don't try and pull that data. All those kinds of things. Um, yeah, they're going to be interesting UI controls to build. Yeah, that that's awesome. Although I will say I totally agree with you, Poski. Although just a, a note is that when you're when you're in a marketplace and doing intents, you mostly don't have actual inventoried resources. You know, so like the the intent peat pipes may go in the opposite order of priority than you know events or something. But yeah, that's cool. Yeah. And there's a whole bunch of yeah issues around people like you know do do we want to try to adopt a taxonomy that a lot of people can use do we want to kind of build that from the bottom up where people who trade with each other or groups you know like in seattle what is you know or something um how much agreement yeah. do we need on that stuff and how do we get it it's, and it's even for me it's thing. even stuff like what is worth sticking in the back end and what should just be browser preferences of the user like if i've got a set of work types that i use that i do all the time just as a preference that i never send anywhere or store anywhere in public um yeah there's, there's all kinds of data sets like that that we might want to weave into these controls just to assist with data entry and can i bring in a fork or a flavor that interests me uh and maybe that is like a fork of marketplace that I'd love to drive, which is um, like really weaving it with communities. So I might like to push an offer, but have it land differently with different communities. So maybe if I have eggs, I want to offer it, offer them as a gift to this community that I'm really close to at a discount to maybe a farmer's community and maybe, you know, ruthless negotiative pricing for the broader public. And yeah. so that would be so cool. Like when I push an intent, it lands on different communities differently. Um, and so I think that's like what I, I think like a neighborhood's flavor to marketplace, which would be really cool. Um, so yeah. the data structure supports that in that you can have your eggs intent, you mm. know, that you want to offer mm. you can attach that to different exactly. proposals for this community i want to offer this same yeah. exact instance of the intent for this other reciprocal you know yeah. request and over here i want to do this and over here it's just a gift or yeah. whatever so that's yeah yeah and that's, and then, that's a, a whole other that's a whole other type of, of linkage. yeah but yeah i agree i think it needs its own fork and then i can also see to close out lynn's thought like when there is a fulfillment like it goes and notifies you know whatever these, the intent has landed, so the you know the the offer closes out. Um, so all you need to fork Sid is the UI. I mean, Holo REA supports yeah. all of that. Oh, I meant so. a fork in the conversation. Um, okay, like, yeah. <laughs> fork in the conversation, no problem. Because <laughs> uh, I know this may not interest everyone, um, but like a more uh, neighborhoods flavored marketplace well so that same pattern is hilo can also address that same yeah. pattern because in hilo you can make one post and then send it to three different communities mm. but in that you would just say in this community you can do this in this community you can do this it's just mm. an extra layer mm. yeah and I, I want to add too that this stuff that lynn's talking about now is actually an additional layer of complexity on top of everything that we've already discussed because you're then talking about 
like the way I've coded this form, it's, you know, you, you enter stuff into the form and you submit it all at once. But for this, it's like you need to be able to submit the individual intents in different places and then come back and comb them together in proposals and be able to pick the intents that are already existing to link them to multiple proposals. Um, so yeah, yeah, another UI to happen somewhere along the line for that potentially, just so that you can curate things that are already going on in different parts of production and add them to a marketplace, you know, so there's, there's even intents that are part of your internal production process where you're doing your compost, you know, to biofuel yeah. transformation. And you, you could actually put those directly on the marketplace and have members of the public carry them out for you. So it's always a question of how much complexity, you know, mm. do we want to start with? It'd be really useful, I think, to look at Basin's specific requirements, maybe, or maybe Seattle, like what you know of the whole, that ecosystem's um, requirements for something like a marketplace would be well, interesting. What's interesting is there's this idea of a marketplace that's user-friendly and simple, but then there's also this like enterprise level need. And it seems like as long as we try, maybe we keep them separate, you know, I don't like some people don't need to know all those details and some people do. <clears throat> yeah, I think that's um, a really good question. Cause like, you know, with the circular economy, we're talking about, you know, way more stuff than like just little one-off personal kinds of, you know, I'm, I'm out of eggs or something, you know, it's like right. setting up, you can set up whole supply chains, right? You can, you know, there's just a, it's, yeah, a little more industrial strength possibly or something. Yes. In the I mean, both are needed. I don't mean to belittle right. personal, you know, needs. I think those are also really valuable. Right. There, and there's just the the level of complexity that's needed from the consumer to the level of a business. <laughs> um, I I was also hoping to, before we go, just uh, possibly ask you about any updates on the mapping front. I'm talking to um, Bear next week, and it seems like there's a few mapping initiatives going on. Um, it seems like Guillen's got something with Josh. I think some of Jakub, Jakub said something about um, some kind of data visualization going on. Um, you and I have been chatting about it, so just curious where you're at with things. Yeah, actually my internet was down last night, so I didn't make it to the Castro call, but um, yeah, I, was, I think they might have been speaking about it then, so I'm kind of curious to touch base with diet and game and see what's going on yeah what I was wondering is do we want to start a, a conversation about well there seems to be two conversations in the band but maybe, maybe it's just one like what is going on in the community how do we map this who's mapping it and then you know we've had some specific um, distinctions what is currently being built and um, how and what's blocking you and all those things and then there's a whole other community that's like, you know, like, like us, we want to build a marketplace, but then there's this already potential marketplace is already being built. So I would love to know who's building those things. So I don't try to double build them, you know? So, but I think it's important to start with what's already being built and how do we get to see what's being built? Yeah, protocol is a big part of that for me too. Like that's that's right. the answer to the question: How do we know what other people are building and not duplicate effort? For me, um, what do and you I've, think been, I've been what's well, I've been told that, that a survey think? is not the way to go. I someone told me the survey is not the way to go. So it puts a limitation on things. Could clever hashtags on Twitter um, get that information? Just. Everyone should have a Twitter account if you're building on Holochain, you would think. I don't have a Twitter account, <laughs> nor a like... Facebook account. Okay, no, Sorry. No <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, um, yeah, I think it's kind of something that there's a few people who are quite active that 
are kind of going to be holding it at the moment. Like it's, I think what you may be getting at is it's one of those things you open it up too much and it becomes a mess or you don't open it up enough and you just don't have the bandwidth to get it done and make it useful. So I'm kind of hoping that the spreadsheet, easy data entry nature of this makes it more the case that people use it. And I did notice a few people have updated it recently. So yeah, yeah. can you sh can you share the the spreadsheet? I heard about that today, and I think that um, it's the one that I've given. I gave you access to. Oh, you did. Oh, okay. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, the hang on, I'll put it in the chat. The regenerative, uh, sorry, generative resilient sovereign tech. That one. I will say, come on, like I, I hear what you're saying. I think there's a bunch of people who expressed what you expressed the need for that coordination. Um, and so I guess there are efforts blooming. I will also say, ultimately, there are different objectives. Like people want to go in different ways with the Holochain tools or interpret agent centricity differently. And so I think that will also be inevitable, like we see flavors and forks emerging. Um, and I think that might even affect like these decisions, right? Like do you go with more with React or more modular UI or um, do you use Wagyu flows or do you just build mutual credit as standalone apps that get changed? Like all of that, I think plays into those priorities ultimately. Which which I'm 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 celebrating. Like I actually think that's a great thing. Like we can accommodate for all of these approaches. So yeah, and I think most people are currently in that phase where they're figuring out where, like, what they want to do with this, or where they want to go. Like, is it more enterprise, or is it more like social leading to commerce? Is it more membrane-y, or is it more global? Like all of that defines these decisions. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah, no, it's great to see you. I, I appreciate this. Thank you, Pospi. And uh, yeah, yeah, I feel like this conversation yeah. itself was very clarifying for, mm -hmm. for me to just see what's been in Pospi and Lynn and Bob's head for a while. Um, so yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other closing thoughts? We are over time. I'm yeah, curious. I didn't want to. In, sorry, come on. I, I didn't want to interrupt because everyone was saying interesting things. But I was uh, thinking about where does the uh, local kind of aspect of all of these transactions come from? Is it in the the marketplace that you're sharing on? Is it assumed that that's going to be local, or is it on? You know, is it just a component that needs to be built? that you pick your location and that gets attached to whatever um, REA transaction occurs. Yeah, that's probably that kind of thing, I think. I think it can go either way. I mean, I think some marketplaces are just like some, you know, if you're doing a mutual credit, you need a fairly close trusting group on some level. If you're just out, you know, being, eBay or something, you know, it's a whole different kind of scene. If you're Seattle, you know, there's, you know, there's, I don't know. It's, I think it's going to depend. And I think it all needs to get done. Yes, Bob? I, I wanted to, uh, th before we quit here, throw a fairly quick thought experiment at you all, not to discuss now, but just to th this is like social plus economic thought experiment. Okay? Mm. Okay, so we're, we're in our social media medium and we're discussing, we would like to have a nice dinner tomorrow night. And you say, oh, okay, so what do we wanna eat? Okay. Uh, okay, okay, yeah, okay, that, that, okay, I like that, okay, so we discussed that for a while, so, well, what's the recipe for that, what do you need, what ingredients do you need, how are we going to get those ingredients, who needs to cook, who knows how to cook that, what equipment do you need to cook that, how are we going to find all these things together, this has to come together by tomorrow night, so that tomorrow night comes, 
okay, did we get everything we were supposed to get? You know, okay, now, do we owe anybody any money for this kind of stuff? You know, did anybody pay any money for this? Maybe we should put a, put a, some, some, start a pool, put some money in a hat, and then spread it out to the people that helped us put this dinner together. And, uh, okay, that's the end of the thought experiment. I've seen something similar to this um, with a camping app for um, like, uh, I think it was REI. It's like a, you know, like a gear place, but like who's going to bring the tent and who's going to bring this thing. And um, <clears throat> I love that idea. Makes sense. <laughs> Camping is a great twist. I love it. <laughs> you definitely don't uh, want to forget anything from camping. More complicated. No, I was also thinking about social work. So a lot of my friends work in social work and um, I then started thinking about how that applies to these uh, systems that we're developing when you might have people on, on the well, there are people that don't have the resources to be able to engage in these things. And how do you get, how do you get like the concept of a social work, someone that can manage the services and manage the relationships that need to happen through these platforms. But that's probably another question for another time. I wanted to uh, see if I can answer your location uh, question or the, the locality question. And I'm gonna, of course, use Hilo again, just because I'm thinking it's seeing a lot of patterns that I'm seeing. Um, when you post on Hilo, um, you can give it a location, but these little icons, these net, this is a network icon. So you can literally discover a whole nother network. So let's say this is all like, I don't know, fruit trees or something. I can click on this and this would be all the clothes, let's say. Um, so at the time of post, and this this whole this whole um, avenue came when when um, Possibly was saying how to post something, and it real I realized there's a connection on when you post, you can post to multiple places, but that map can also be a place of discovery. So I, I, I wonder if this, I don't know if mapping helps you think about it, locality. I'm just curious about your thoughts on that. Yeah, mapping is um, one of the solutions, I think, to um, how to find stuff locally. And I'll, I'll just add, um, Sam, this maps on really well with the marketplace fork that I was talking about because location shows up as one reputational data point. Right. And so you could basically have like marketplaces with a filter of no more than three kilometers radius or like pricing based on location or something. I mean, you can play with it based on your context. Um, yeah. Yeah. But I guess that's a, another rabbit hole we could slide down um should we close let's close with that and unless there's some burning last comments i guess not so yeah thank you thanks Pospi. thanks kamal and thanks to thanks everyone for the questions yeah talk soon thanks thanks, thanks. for coordinating sid